Good evening and welcome to this event at the Brighton Festival celebrating the life and nature of Sir David Attenborough. It's not given to many of us to have a Mesozoic reptile named after us, <laughs> but such was the honour awarded to David and Robert Backer, the paleontologist, christened to find Attenborosaurus coniberi. <laughs> Here's an attic full of honours and a library of complimentary press clippings, but astonishingly, he's remained true to his beginnings. Please welcome Sir David Attenborough. I spoke of the museum in the introduction, um, of stones and fossils. Did, <coughs> can we imagine, or do we think of, a free roving life? The fields, you ran out on your own or with your brother Richard, or whoever, and collected stuff, and there was a feeling of immense communal security, and that sort of stuff. I, I was very, uh, it's perfectly true, I was very keen on fossils and, and birds and snakes and so on. Um, and in those days, which is now what I'm talking about, 35, 36, um, you, I could get on my bicycle at the age of 10, 11, 12 and go off into the countryside um, looking, collecting fossils or looking at collecting birds' eggs, I have to tell you, which is illegal now. Um, but that was how I learnt about the natural world and I was um, never happier than when I was by myself actually doing that. Um, and it's easy to be sniffy about, about collecting. But for a biologist or a naturalist, it's absolutely the bedrock, it's the core. It's looking at objects, looking at natural objects and deciding that this is slightly different from that in this respect particularly, or that it is very much different than that, and so perhaps it's not belonging to that at all, but belonging to the other over there. Charles Darwin collected beetles uh, obsessively. Uh, uh, and he knew more about the Beatles of Cambridge and uh, of Shrewsbury than, than almost anybody. Um, and so it's a great thing to collect. And I was very lucky to collect, and, and, and I, I make no apology, as you see. <laughs> now, um, how did you get into the BBC, and how did you get on the screen? I applied for... I was in Bob Publishing, which I thought was extremely boring, uh, and I saw an advertisement in the Times, the BBC Radio wanted a producer, I thought I could do that job, and I wrote and didn't get an interview, uh, nothing. I think I got an acknowledgement, but, but nothing else. And then about a, a month later maybe, I got a letter from someone I'd never heard of, but on BBC notepaper, that said, um, we've seen your application, um, and we know we did, you weren't suitable for radio, but we've got this new thing, which we call television. <laughs> and a lot of people think it's rubbish, but, but you know, it could be, there could be something there. Are you interested in coming to learn to be a television producer? And I said, yes. So that's how that happened. You got there, and you did all sorts of things. There isn't time, but you did all sorts of different programs, Animal, Vegetable, Mineral, Mortimer Wheeler, The Twirly World, His Moustache, and all that sort of thing. But let's go, how you, how the zoo quest started, and how you got on the screen. And in those days, you produced everything, and any producer worth his salt. Well, you were there, Melvin, yeah. were a, bit, a bit after that, but we produced everything. Political discussions, knitting, sewing, gar gardening, religion, everything. Um, and I eventually, as it grew, I managed to specialise in natural history, and I went out with a team to film uh, sequences in Africa, for a team from the London Zoo. The zoo were collecting animals. And the idea was that we did a short film sequence of showing Africa, and then uh, you see this chap jumping on a snake, and then we would dissolve the studio live, so where this chap would be wrestling with a snake and explaining as to how interesting it all was. Um, and the first one went out, and Jack was, uh, unfortunately, the, the chap from the London Zoo, very ill immediately afterwards. And it was in the Radio Times, it had these live sequences in it, so. Um, the, the head of television program said, well, he can't do it because he's in hospital. Somebody's got to do it. You're the only bloke there apart from the cameraman, so you do it. A staff, no fee, you see. So, 
so that's how I appeared on television. And, uh, and I had to take the rest of the series, and that's what it was. At that time, the BBC believed that if they got hold of people they thought had some sort of talent, the ideas and the drive came from them. Yes. They didn't come from above, editors on editors, banks of editors, banks. They came from the people they'd hired, men and women, Grace and Grace Wyndham Gold, you know, who, and that, I thought, was, it was paradise for somebody coming in. Well, yeah. I, I was a few, quite a few Me years too. after you, but it was, it was paradise. Yeah, we were Because you put ideas forward, and they said, well, let's think about it, and you pounded mm. away at them, and they said, well, we'll give in, do it. Yeah, and yeah. if someone said, I think you ought to do this, because it's important, mm. yeah. you know. Now, we didn't say because it's popular. We said it's important. It's important that people should know about this sort of thing, that should be represented. So we'll do it. Now then, you went back to university, we haven't got time to talk about that, but you became uh, <laughs> controller of BBC Two, and then later you became director of programming. Anyway, you went into the administration of BBC Two, it's a great time for BBC Two, where you had the fun of saying to these young people, yes, we will do your programs. Why did you move into the job of being the controller of BBC Two? It was a very, I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, long hours, it's an administrative job, there you are, stuck in an office most of the time. Why did you want to do that at that stage? Well, you and I, we both know that there was a man called Hugh Weldon. Yeah. Uh, and you and I were both his acolytes. Uh, I, I thought he was one of the most remarkable men in British broadcasting, and I think you thought Absolutely, well, yeah. the same. Um, and Hugh came to me and said, uh, we've got this new network. Uh, it's been going for um, nine, ten months, uh, and it's having a rocky time, um, and it needs new programming policies and so on. Will you do it? Now, if you cared tuppence for television as a medium, if you cared tuppence about making programs, that was a job and an invitation you could not possibly refuse. Um, and uh, the first job was to, was to decide what the policy of the network was. And it was easy to, to uh, determine it in those days. Um, you couldn't do it now. But uh, what I said was that we, will, we are not interested in doing carbon copies of uh, programs that are on anywhere, other network anywhere in the world. We will be doing new things. Everything we do will have something significant about it which is new. Um, and we did. Well, that's a wonderful opportunity, and we, and we had a, just a great time. And aided by the fact that hardly anybody could see it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you came back into programming, thank goodness. Um, why did you come back into programming? I did four years on BBC Two, and then I did four years um, being responsible for both networks. And being responsible for both networks was um, a, a terrible job. I mean, you were you weren't, you weren't involved in programmes, you were involved in money, finance, politics, sacking people, insurances, technology, you know, management methods, poo. You know. <laughs> so, so, uh, I thought I'd have much more fun uh, looking for bats. When you made that, that first series, David, did you, had you in mind to uh, run, to, was that supposed to be, intended to be, the first of many? No, it was, no, there were a lot of people who thought that it would, would uh, be a disaster, uh, because what we tried to do in there was, if we were doing a program about, uh, what should we say, uh, um, frogs, we would show frogs from all around the world. Uh, and show why they were different and how they were different and what that meant. And people said, the Natural History Unit, they said, it'll never work, people. The viewers will be absolutely baffled. They won't know where, what continent they were in anything. And I said, well, I think we'll be able to construct a thought process, a thought link, which is stronger than mere geography. And, and we'll put forward ideas. So well, it was by no means uh, a certainty. And the other complicated thing about it was there were 13 one-hour programs. Now, you don't make 13 one-hour programs, as we both know, uh, in three weeks or in three months. You actually take three years to make 13 programs. And the embarrassment was that you started and you didn't know whether it was going to work. And, and it wasn't until you were halfway through the last year that we could get enough together, because it was shot all around the world, uh, to realize that it was going to be OK. Were you, were you conscious that you were doing things and showing things and talking about things that we could all see for the first time? Yes, I think. I think Can you I give think us one or two examples, Dave? Um, 
Well, um, uh, uh, there was a lot of the marine stuff that nobody had seen before. Small, unobtrusive things. People had seen big fish, they'd been seen with whales, but they hadn't seen a lot of coral fish. Um, insect life, people had hardly seen at all. Uh, plant life, people had not seen it speeded up in the way that we were able to do it. So that um, at the end of it, you had a comprehensive view of, of, of the life on this planet, which no other generation could have had. What about the gorillas? I mean, did you were smiling, I thought, gallantly. <laughs> I'd have been screaming. Uh, 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 what, what about that? You, you went right in among them. Were you frightened? Was there a man with a gun behind the camera? I mean, what was going on there? No, there's no man with a gun behind the camera, that's for sure. Um, the, the thing was that uh, it, it was part of the, the last program but one, and we were talking about the arrival of mankind. And the arrival and the evolution of mankind depends on the opposable thumb, that is to say, the ability to put the thumb against the forefinger, which apes had to do in order to be able to climb. But if once you get that, it's a grip, and you can use that as a tool. Once you start making tools, you're on the way to civilization. So the opposable thumb was very important. And we knew that we could be able to get, I would be able to get into a position where gorillas were maybe 20 or 15 yards away, and they wouldn't run, nor would they attack us. Uh, and I would be able to do this stuff about the opposable thumb, see? So we, we got ourselves in that situation, found the guerrilla group. I crawled across. The, we were gesturing to one another the signals with the cameraman. And the cameraman gave me, the director gave me the cue to go. And I looked at the camera. And suddenly, I felt a huge hand on top of my head. <laughs> and, and I turned around, and there was this enormous gorilla. Um, and I thought, this is not the moment I'm going to talk about the opposable thumb. <laughs> Um, and then a huge finger, I mean, just immense. So I put a, a finger in my mouth, <laughs> so I'm looking up. And I still felt the opposable thumb wasn't up, but pumped most in my mind. And, and, and then I felt a weight on my feet, and I looked down, and two baby gorillas, her babies in fact, uh, were undoing my shoelaces. <laughs> and, and, and at this stage, I was... Honestly, it was, I was in kind of delirium of, of, of paradise, really. I mean, there was no question of being frightened. Uh, they had come to me. I had not seen them coming. They'd come right out of the tall grass. Uh, and they were simply curious about me. And they, the last thing was aggression. And so I was kind of, where you say I was looking, whatever you said I was looking, what I was looking was, oh, I could hardly <laughs> believe this is true. Um, and at the end of it, after about, I don't know how long, but I should think it was about 10 minutes. I mean, it was a tremendous time. Uh, they finally, the little ones gambled off, and she heaved herself up and shambled off. And I went back to the camera team, and I said, was that fantastic? Uh, and the director said, um, yep, yep, I think, I think we've got, you know, uh, 10 seconds or so. And I said... 10 seconds or so. I was there for 10 minutes. He said, well, I'd only got 150 feet of film in the camera, and I was waiting for you to go on about the yellow pony. <laughs> you, may, you mentioned the crew there, and you, you, the BBC had set up a natural history unit in Bristol. Now, you were asked to go there, but you decided to stay in London, but you've worked with them a lot. What was the advantage of that unit being, A, a unit, and B, out of London, on its own, like a sort of commando, almost commando in television terms, SSU, which must have been rather exciting, really? Um, departments uh, and regions were invited to say, well, they'd like to specialise it. The boys in Bristol said natural history, because there was a very remarkable chap there called, uh, called Hawkins, Desmond Hawkins, who was very keen, did, did radio programs about natural history. And they had Peter Scott down there. And so, and so they started natural history. And uh, it's, it's actually very good if you get a flourishing department in a region that's rooted in a region, it becomes a, a very important center. And Bristol is worldwide important natural history-wise, worldwide. And also when they're working tightly together, we'll have to remember what happens is that they they can get on. It's a bit like the Cavendish Laboratory, isn't it? They're, they're working, they're a peer group. 
tightly <laughs> together. Again, for the right reasons. It's not, they're talking, they, they're not going for the money and that, they're going for the thing itself. And, and the advances they're making in those circumstances are remarkable. Absolutely. I mean, and there, there's advances, a, there's remarkable. an enormous esprit de corps, yeah. and there's an enormous concentration of expertise. And the other thing, now this is going to sound rather pious, but it is absolutely true that you aren't in the Natural History Unit in Bristol unless you actually care above all things about natural history. Um, and so you aren't there actually grinding your own axe. You aren't there edging your pillar. You are all interested in natural history and you all share one another's uh, disasters or triumphs uh, or, and inventions of new techniques and so on. Um, and it's a, a marvelous college of, of, of expertise as all of us know from many of your programs, is how much you push yourself and push yourself to do things and take risks with yourself in the frame, taking us there, literally taking us there. How important was it, do you think, for the, for the programs, for the series, for the films, that you did that, that you pushed yourself, you went down the valleys, up the mountains, up the streams and so on, up rivers and so on and so forth? I think if, if somebody appears in picture, he should have a very clear idea, in this sort of program, you should have a very clear idea of why he is there. And there are about six very good reasons why a narrator should be in picture. One, uh, he can, you can see who it is who's talking with the commentary. Two, he can paragraph things. Three, uh, he can give you an indication as to whether it's hot or cold or dangerous or whatever. Um, and four, he can talk about abstract things, which is quite a difficult thing to do when you're showing uh, examples of, of chimpanzees. If you want to make some abstract view about apes in general and you're showing a picture of chimpanzee, people think that's about chimpanzees and not about apes in general. So it's better to come to the narrator who could talk about those generalizations. And that's one, and I, and I hope that when I wrote the scripts for those things, I had it in mind at all times as to why it was I was in shot and um, why it was I was getting in between the camera and the animal. We're beginning to see here um, a, a darker note in the sense that in the last episode of The Living Planet, you're beginning to talk about the <coughs> possible destruction of the environment. Now, this is 1984 doing that. And um, why did you introduce that in this, uh, in this series, which could be said to be exploratory, celebratory, educational in the broadest sense? What, what, what took you in that direction? Because I was very obvious. It wasn't obvious in the 1950s. In the 1950s, when we did those Zoo Quest programs, zoos, reputable scientific zoos, thought if they had an animal and it died, they thought, OK, well, we're going to get another one. Um, but by now, the 1980s, it was absolutely clear that that was an illusion, that we human beings were now so numerous on the surface of the planet that wild animals were very, very pressed for space, and some species were very, very pressed for space to the very threaten their existence. Um, and if you're making that sort of thing, um, it seems to me, particularly since the last program was about humanity and what humanity had done to the, palette, to the um, planet, that you had an obligation to say that, which I did. Can you just tell us all about uh, the difficulties there and what you thought really worked and how refinements in technology make them work as well as they did work? I think almost every series um, that I've done has been uh, stimulated by a particular technical advance. Um, suddenly, uh, when we started, we, we, we couldn't do synchronous sound. You couldn't have picture and, and sound together, but that was solved. Um, and then, right at the beginning of making natural history films, the film was so insensitive that you couldn't film in a, in a forest. There simply was not enough light. Well, then that was solved because you got more sensitive stocks. Um, then you wanted to do, um, speed up motion and so that you could see how plants move. That was the thing. And so everyone has had a new, a new way, uh, a, a new technique that you've been able to exploit. Um, and that's been very valuable because it meant that you were able to go into the new areas. Now, uh, I have to say, perhaps it's my lack of imagination, but there's very little we can't do now. There's very little of the, of the animal world and plant world that we can't show. There's really microscopic things we can't show, or not very successfully. The bottom of the sea we can't show, and that's a huge area which, which uh, we have very little knowledge of. But almost everything else, 
uh, we can do. I mean, the, one, of the, one of the most miraculous things that we can do, um, which still makes me gulp with excitement, um, is that when, us, when you started making natural history films, the, the problem was always to anticipate what the animal was going to do. That if the bird was going to come and land on the nest, you had to be there tensed up so that you pressed the button and you got the beginning of the shot of the bird coming through and actually landing on the nest, and that was what you had to have. Uh, and that was, meant that a lot of stuff you didn't, you, it was no good because you, the beginning of the shot was missing. Now that doesn't matter. Because believe it or not, now you can take the shot after you press the button. Because there is a device in the machine which is continually recording and, and wiping in its wake. So it's going around and you can set it so that its, its, its circuit lasts for 30 seconds. So if you press it there, you've still got that you come off that circular device and you've still got the 30 seconds that was there before, if you see what I mean. In natural history, that's been a huge boom and, and has enabled us to do lots of things that we would never have been able to do before. And the underwater photography, you say underwater you the photography, bed, but the underwater photography is wonderful. Yeah. Commander Cousteau, yeah. invented at the end of the war. French, wonderful. Nobody had seen underwater uh, before the last war. Nobody. I mean, there was no underwater film at all. Now, this uh, year has quite rightly been, been the great Darwin year. When you were at Cambridge, was his significance as generally accepted? I think he was, honestly. Uh, I think that there is no branch of... I mean, before Darwin, um, natural history and zoology was largely stamp collecting. What Darwin did was to produce a coherent and cohesive theory that explained all the phenomena that you can see, that slots it into place. Without Darwin, there is no logic in There is no coherent thing which hangs it all together. Uh, we celebrate him now because it was 200 years since his birth, 150 years since they published The Origin of Species. But uh, now there is no question whatsoever about the reality of the, uh, of the evolution of life. What is at more at issue and more debatable is the, whether we know all the processes that bring about those changes and those developments. Uh, in natural selection, which Darwin identified, is certainly a major one. There may be others we don't know. But as to the reality of the evolution of life on this planet, there can be no doubt. Well, thank you all very much for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And thank you once again to David Attenborough. <laughs>